Good morning, Jump Start Nation. Praise God. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Happy Friday. I bless your day. I bless you in Jesus' name. You're blessed whether I bless you or not. So I'm agreeing with God that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Lana. And I want to thank all of you. Good morning, Joel. Good to see you, brother. Good morning, honey. Good morning, Lincoln. Good morning, buddy. Hi, Lincoln. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for texting. Some of you are still don't, but I wish to encourage you, please say hello or hi. Don't, don't be full of pride. Don't do that. Get on. Be, be help, help out and say hi. If all you do is say hi, uh, it blesses people. Don't be stingy with your hellos. Good morning, Jackie. Good to see you. Thank you, Jana and Lincoln. I'm sure is saying hi back to you. <laughs> Good morning, Carlos and Terry. Praise God. Be a part of Jumpstart Nation and, and type in a high. People need you. Don't, don't think that you're not needed, not wanted, that you can just be a wallflower. Oh, man. Good morning, Sue. Don't be full of pride. Praise God and think that you don't matter. That's just a proud thing. Hey, Lincoln. Hi, buddy. Hi, Lincoln. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Lincoln's my buddy. Praise God. Jackson's my buddy. I get to see Jackson tomorrow. He's coming in from Lexington with mom and dad, Cynthia and Addison. And I'll get to, he's my talker. Praise God. Amen. But just jump on. I, I, um, you are, you are wanted. Praise God. You're wanted. We want to hear you. Good morning, Kelly Sue. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning to you. Good morning, Mary. Praise God. You know, fear of rejection, um, Everybody fears that. Some are worse than others. Codependents are horrible about that because their self-worth is based on somebody else's reaction. You know, uh, when somebody reacts negatively toward you, that's not a reflection of how much they love you. That's a reflection of how much they love themselves. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, okay. Ho, ho, okay. Good morning, Lindsay. Good morning, Megan. Nancy, I had the opportunity to go back and hear Rhea's message from Wednesday JSN, wow, so powerful. You know, I, I, uh, I'm going to go back and listen to it today. Rhea said it was very powerful. Praise God. And uh, so thankful just for what God's doing. He's just doing awesome stuff. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, it's amazing. Jana and Nancy have never met. One's in North Carolina. One's in Texas. And they get to meet in Maysville, Kentucky in less than a month. I'm excited. Oh, and um, I wanted to show you guys this, y'all, this, before we get started. Um, I'm here at the church, and we're getting ready. We're making preparations and getting our volunteers ready to be a blessing to you all. And uh, we're just excited, scurrying about. But uh, Paige Reese Grayson helped us immensely. We've got our shirts in. All of our all of our jump starts. Uh, this is Byron Mills Ministry shirts. These are our Byron Mills Ministries shirts for those that are interested. All folded, organized, uh, and then over here we've got our awesome Jump Start Nation. I love that. Look how she's got the head start on him. She starts. She got a jump start because she knows how to speak the word. She jump starts her day speaking the word. And so here's our Jump Start Nation shirts. Beautiful. Blue uh, for you ladies. And then the Jumpstart. I love this logo that Rhea designed. It's JN with Jumpstart Nation in it. I love that. And, of course, uh, down here, all of these um, are organized. And we are just excited. And we've already got the, the prices up and stuff. So we're getting our, our victory room, our Jumpstart room, our victory room, getting it ready to go. And... We're excited, man. I'm excited, praise God. I love that logo. I like them all, but I love this. This is the image I had as uh, as I begin to say, jumpstart your day. I wasn't thinking so much about a battery charger, even though that is part of it, a battery charger. Good morning, Jerry. It is awesome, Nancy. And uh, I, you know what will happen is hopefully somebody may ask you, what in the world is jumpstart? 
what is jump start and you'll be able to say she got a jump start in her life and a jump start on her day because she's learned to speak the word only praise the lord thank you thank you that's awesome praise god hallelujah so anyway we're getting ready uh we we're not doing the mugs yet i think we're going to do the l- mugs online at tea, tea springs store where you would actually order it online uh and that way we're not buying it up front but uh, we're working on that praise god it's exciting it's exciting it's exciting thank you jesus praise god yeah absolutely ron absolutely ron and we're speaking victory over you and your situation with your family and uh, we're excited about that praise god it's a great day hilda to praise god you're absolutely right amen 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 thank you i'm excited to we Re- and i are just excited we're excited to see your face we're just excited to see your all's face. That's the main thing. And it's just going to be a good weekend. Hey, Michelle. Good morning. And Mary Graham is going to be the, the chef in the house. Woo, woo, woo. Anointed. Praise God. It's going to be awesome. She's excited about that. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey, Diane. Good to see you in Florida. Praise God. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Elaine. Good morning. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I did not know. I was so clueless yesterday. But you said you were a toe-stepping Baptist. And I thought you meant like they they danced in the Holy Ghost in that church, like spirit-filled. And then it was like, duh. When I went back and looked at the comments, you were talking about you got your toe stepped on. (laughs) Amazing. Amazing. We're getting tremendous uh, feedback from Rhea's jump start on Wednesday. Uh, I haven't seen it. I'm going to see it today. I've got to drive about 50 miles away to get the oil changed in our van. I'm going to take the time to listen to the Word and feed on the Word of God and catch up with what Andrew is doing and hear some of the stuff he's ministering and listen to Rhea, her jump start. Praise God. And it's going to be good. And I want to thank many, many, many of you who have already told us privately that this codependency series that we're on for this season, we won't be on it forever, but um, that, that on this, yes, yeah, and then washed your feet. <laughs> you, you know what we should invent? We could be wealthy. We could, we could start a multi-million dollar business, Elaine. Uh, we could uh, start manufacturing steel-toed dress shoes for church. Steel-toed dress shoes for church. Preacher proof. Glory to God, then your toes can't be stepped on. Amen. Well, that's what the gospel is. Jesus said in you know, Ephesians 6, he has, uh, the, he has prepared our feet with the gospel of peace. Prepared our feet with the gospel of peace. Man, that's awesome. Anyway, many of you have given us feedback on the codependency. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord sort of hijacked yesterday. And uh, we were talking about his love, talking about his love. And, uh, man, it's absolutely amazing that his love for us is first love. And if you're emphasizing your love for God more than his love for you, you are religious. If you're emphasizing uh, his, I know, Jackie, whatever, you guys are, you all are awesome. Praise God. You guys have your own conversation. You're like a rowdy classroom on Jumpstart. Uh, quick reminder. Right now, hit that share button. Get down there and share. Make sure it's going public and not just to a little group. You gotta, Facebook will tweak your buttons and to limit you, but uh, uh, make sure you hit it and share it. But uh, if you are more focused on God's demand in your life and you're not focused on the supply of God, you're a religious person and you're under condemnation. The gospel and the grace of God makes us supply conscious. We're conscious of his supply. Man, in every area of life. But if you're living under this consciousness of the demands of God, his demand that you live right, do right, read your Bible, pray, go to church, um, go to the altar, uh, pray so much. Um, If you're under this consciousness of the demands of God, you are under the old covenant, you're under condemnation, and it'll kill you. But when you get under the truth of the new covenant, you become aware of his supply. 
you become aware of the supply of God. Thank you for sharing, every one of you. And out of that supply, you produce good works. Out of that supply, you operate in good works. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I was meditating on Ephesians 2.10 today uh, in, in, my, in my confession and, and, and meditating in the, in the Word this morning. And uh, I was muttering Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship, recreated, Epiphany says, recreated in Christ Jesus to do those good works which he foreordained and prepared ahead of time for us. And I, I saw it. God, we are God's work. We are the product of God's effort. We are the product of God's work. We are God's workmanship. I know, Wanda, it is. It's good, man. We are God's workmanship recreated to do good work. So what God did, God's work in our spirit has supernaturally designed us to do good works. We don't do good works to get to God. God, God did a work in recreating us and his work has given us the supernatural ability to do the good works that he called us to do. Man, we are designed by God to do good works. But you're not doing works to earn God's approval. You're doing wonderful, lovely works out of the love of your heart, out of the supply of God's grace. You're doing good things because of the work that God has done. Man, that's awesome. We're not trying to move God. God's love and grace is moving us. It's, it's moving us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, glory. Amen. Amen. And then um, and then in Galatians chapter uh, 3, I love this, Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is dealing with these people in the, the churches of Galatia. It's a large area, many churches. They had gotten saved by grace, purely by the love and grace of God, but then they had turned it into works, praise God, and uh, they had turned it into effort and works and all that. And he's getting them back on track. And so in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Hallelujah. I guess somebody's having trouble with their sound. I'm hearing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm getting some feedback from some of you are hearing okay. <laughs> Amen. So it could be an issue on your end. The, the the Internet has been a little glitchy lately, but I don't know if you know that or not. It's been a little glitchy lately. Um, but um, he who supplies, he who supplies the Spirit, this word supplies is the Greek word choreography. It's a choreographer. Um, we see choreography as somebody that designs a dance, but the word choreo, choreograph here in the Greek, is the person who pays for the whole show. He provides the costumes. He provides the venue. He provides the lights, the sound, the music. He feeds the dancers. He feeds the actors. He takes care of the transportation. He provides everything that's needed for the show to happen. That, that's what this word supply means. So God is the choreographer of your life. He's supplying for everything you need to do to perform what you need to perform, all right, is already provided for you. It's already uh, provided for you. But notice that he who supplies the Spirit to you, we should be more aware of what he is supplying than what he is demanding. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now listen, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you. Who's working the miracles? He is. And how is he working the miracles? By supplying his spirit. By supplying the spirit of God. Supplying the anointing. You know how he's working financial miracles in this day and age. And in in, in inflation. How he's supplying every miracle you need. He's working miracles. God is working miracles among you. It didn't say if you pray and fast. It doesn't say if you pray and fast. It doesn't say if you call out to God, if you have a prayer meeting. If, man, if we'll just pray, there will be a move of God. That isn't true. He doesn't say if we pray. See, we always put a condition on things. 
we always put a condition. I received a letter from a precious friend, precious ministry friend, loved them dearly, and they said, how do you find your destiny? And uh, he gave four steps. Step number two was invite God to come and work in your life. And then he put a scripture under that. In Philippians 2, 10 or 11, For it is God who is working in you, causing you to will and do of his good pleasure. He said, you need to invite God to work in your life and gave that verse. I said, isn't it strange that that verse says God is working in you without you inviting him? And yet this preacher, this minister, sincere, added a step that we had to do. You've got to invite him to do it. No, can I encourage you, stop inviting and start acknowledging. Stop inviting God to do what He's already doing and start acknowledging Him. I wish this minister, instead of saying, you know, invite God to work in your life, which, puts, which gives us the impression that He's not working unless I do invite Him. And, and I wish he would have said, step two to finding your destiny is begin to acknowledge that God is working in your life because He's in you. He's working in your spirit right now. Uh, your wall-to-wall Holy Ghost, your wall-to-wall glory, your wall-to-wall power, your spirit is alive and vibrating and, and shaking with the power and glory of God. You have a dynamo in you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so it's not inviting God. When you got born again, that was the invitation. You invited Jesus to come into your heart. Now, instead of always adding a prayer step in, which is nothing but unbelief, we need to do less praying and more acknowledging. Man, I'm preaching. I'm sorry I'm preaching, but I'm not sorry because I need to hear it. So say this out loud. According to Philippians chapter 2, I acknowledge that God is working in me now, causing me to will and to do of His good pleasure. Ooh, glory be to God. Say it out loud. God's working in me right now. See, you don't need to invite Him. It's a step away. You're adding a step. You're adding a prayer step. Most of the praying that we were doing even in Word of Faith and, and even in grace circles before we got a hold of some things, we were asking God to do what He was already doing. We just need to acknowledge it. Philemon 6 said that the fellowship of your faith may become energized and effective and powerful by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. If you would get busy... Because we're getting busy on Jumpstart Nation, acknowledging every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus, it's causing uh, our fellowshipping of our faith, the, the, the inheritance that's in our faith is activating it. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, so we want to, we're dealing with codependency, and a lot of this is tied into your identity in Christ. And, uh, but I want you to see in Matthew chapter 22, I said at the beginning of this, I said if you uh, uh, are focusing more on God's love for you rather than or your love for God than God's love for you, you're under law, you're under condemnation, and it, it's the ministry of death. God already knows that your love for Him is not going to be perfect on this side of your, uh, on this side of the rapture. He knows that. He knows that you still have flesh to deal with. He knows your mind is not completely renewed. He knows that your love for him in your spirit's perfect. And that's where he's looking at. But God knows that your love for him will never measure up. And that doesn't bother him at all. What he wants you to do is grasp and continue to grow in your understanding of his love for you. Because the more that you understand and grasp with your heart his love for you, the more you will automatically love him. That's his concern. That's his concern. You know, amen. And I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 22, verse, um, uh, verse uh, 34. Matthew twenty-two thirty-four. 34. Jesus, this is, not, this is before the resurrection. This is before the crucifixion. This is still under the old covenant. And they came to him and um, this, uh, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Now, do you know why they were Sadducee? Huh? 
because they did not trust God. That's why they're sad, you see. That's so corny. Oh, Jesus, I hope you get healed from that. Amen. Let it go. Let it. Just pray for me. Praise God. Anyway, and then one of them, a lawyer. One of them, a lawyer. Asked him a question, testing him and saying. Now, what are they testing Jesus on? On his understanding of the law of Moses. This is a law test. This is, a, this is an old covenant test, not a new covenant test. All right? Yeah, I know, Jackie. Just, just, just pray that whoever got damaged by that horrible humor will be... Uh, anyway, they'll be healed. It's that, granddad, it's that granddad humor coming out in me. You know, anyway. Um, Lincoln laughs. That's all that matters. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this lawyer, he says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? All right? In the law, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This is the law. This is the old covenant. This is the law summed up. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What is Jesus talking about here? Uh, I know, Ron, just pray for me. Um, what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about the law. That the, the first commandment, the sum of the law is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, is it important that we love God? Yes. But how do you get there? 1 John 4.19, which is New Covenant, says we love Him because He first loved us. How do, how do you fulfill this? By knowing how much He loves you. If your focus is on loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you think that that's how God rewards you based on how much you love Him, and that God responds to your love by giving you love, that's a conditional love. The law is conditional. If you'll love God, God will love you. We're redeemed from that. I believe that we should love God, but we'll never do it perfectly this side of our of the resurrection, this side of the rapture. So don't get bent out of shape if you don't love God perfectly. Duh, we get it. But guess what? God loves you perfectly. God loves you perfectly. God wants you focused on His perfect love for you more than your imperfect love for Him. Get out of the law. Get out of religion. And stop focusing on your love for Him and begin to feed, voraciously feed on His love for you. Good place to start. 1 John 4, 19. Now, that's where we've got to get free from codependency of trying to help everybody too much, trying to fix people, because we can't help people and fix people if they're not willing to see and hear. We can't do things for people that they won't do for themselves. When we do things for people that they won't do for themselves, I didn't say can't, won't do for themselves, you're crippling them. You're, you're becoming their savior and it won't work. Now, Praise God. Say this out loud. I am delivered and I am free from focusing on my love for God first. I'm under the new covenant where I'm focusing on His love for me. And the automatic response is my love for Him is blossoming and growing. It's a response. Your love for Him is a response. Okay? Not a cause. If you're under a condemnation, if you're under the old covenant, if you're trying to fulfill what Jesus said here, which is a, He was answering the question of a lawyer, a lawyer of Moses, if you are under this old teaching, this denominational teaching, I grew up in it. Trust me, I got a t-shirt in it. Listen, if you are trying to get God to respond to you because of how much you love Him, you become the leader and God becomes the responder. In other words, if you're trying to prove your love for God to get Him to respond, you're trying to control God. 
You're trying to manipulate God, which means you're trying to be God and you're trying to turn him into your servant. Did you see that? If you're trying to prove to God and get him to respond to your love, you're trying to prove to God how much you love him. You now have taken the place of God and made him the lesser one who responds to you. But when you fully acknowledge that you don't love him like you should, you're human, you don't yet love him like you should, and you begin to feed on his love for you. I do too, Ron. I got several t-shirts on this. I'm the God lover. I'm the lover of God. I love God. Uh, when you begin to feed on his love for you and you start responding to his love, now he is God and he's controlling you. That's awesome. Man, that's powerful. Here over in Revelation, and I'll tell you, uh, the best way to do spiritual warfare is not crying, yelling, and screaming at the devil. That's not, that's not spiritual warfare. Yelling, screaming, and you know, if you've got to tell Satan to stop it, tell him to stop it. If you've got to bind him, bind him. But don't just spend every day doing that. The greatest weapon in spiritual warfare is knowing and focusing and acknowledging how much God loves you. And I'm going to prove this to you. Spiritual warfare is responding to the love of God. I'm going to prove it to you. Here in Luke chapter uh, 4. <clears throat> now I'm going to do Matthew. Uh, I think Matthew is even clearer. Luke is good, but I, I like Matthew even better. Let me come over here and look at this. This is on the Mount of, just before the Mount of Temptation. Yeah, so uh, this is the story, Matthew 3.16, where Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. And in 3.17, as Jesus came up out of the waters, John the Baptist brought Jesus up out of the water. Then it says in verse 17, Matthew 3.17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God the Father said that about Jesus before Jesus did one act of, of ministry, before he did one miracle, before he cast out one demon, before Jesus did anything, God said to Jesus, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Praise God. So God wants you to start your life, start your ministry, start your day, start your week, your month, and your year hearing him say, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Somebody says, well, he's not well pleased with me because I've just had a bad attitude and I did this and I've done that and I don't live the way I ought to and he's not pleased with me. Well, then Jesus failed. We have to fix and finish what Jesus said is finished, you know. And uh, that's not the truth. Praise God. The truth is God is perfectly satisfied with what he made you in Christ. Say this out loud. I hear the voice of my father saying to me right now. That I am his beloved child. In whom he is well pleased. Say this out loud. God is well pleased with who I am in Christ. And I am as impressed with who I am in Christ. As God is. Say this out loud. I bring God great pleasure. My spirit is perfectly righteous. And God is pleased with that. Oh my goodness. Now, then right after that, Matthew 4, 1 says, Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 nights and 40, 40 days and nights, now the tempter came to him and said... If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. If you are the Son of God, prove it. Now, what did the devil leave out of that sentence? Beloved. He didn't say, if you are the beloved Son of God. He said, if you are the Son of God. Satan, Satan did not want to remind Jesus at all that God loved him. He wanted to keep that out of the equation. See, a lot of people will tell you, yeah, I'm born again. Yes, I'm a child of God. Yes, I'm a daughter of God. Yes, I'm a son of God. 
But the devil's taking that out of their thinking. You are the beloved. God's in love with you. God is in love with you. Praise God. Say it out loud. I am. And if you're a, a, okay, guys, let's say it first in the gals. Let's say, guys, say this. I am a beloved son of God with whom God is well pleased. All right, sisters, say the same thing. I am a beloved daughter of God. God's in love with me in whom I am well pleased. Now, that is how spiritual warfare happens. Satan removed the love of God out of that. Spiritual warfare is plugging love back into it. I don't care how much you mess up. I don't care how much you sin. When I say I don't care, I, I'm, I don't mean that. I care because I don't want you to destroy yourself. But I want you. it doesn't matter how much you think you don't measure up. It does not matter. You have got to plug God's love back into the equation of your life. It doesn't measure up without God's love. Put, put love back into the equation. Amen? Say it out loud. I am loved by God. He's well pleased with me. Now notice that God said that to Jesus as he came out of the water. The first thing when he came out of that water is that God wanted him, the first thing God wanted Jesus to hear is, I love you and I am pleased with you. Before he did a thing, do you know the minute you accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit buried you and then resurrected you, the minute you were raised up in Christ, the minute you got born again, the first thing God said to you is, Woo! Look at what I've done. Look, you're a brand new creation. Man, I am in love with you. I love you, love you, love you. And I'm well pleased with what I've done. And I love you. You're my very special workmanship. You're my very own unique child. Glory to God. That's spiritual warfare. That's awesome, Michelle. That's awesome. Now, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm trying to get back over to codependency because we're not... But these are the things that cure people of codependency. Of always trying to get your worth and value from how much you help others. Amen. Now, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace. I don't think we sing enough songs about His grace yet. We need to sing to the praise of the glory of His grace. Now, I know there's wacky people preaching universalism that you don't have to believe anything and everybody say they just don't know it and 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 universalism and all of that garbage but you know what i began to get over into that about eight years ago correcting the universalist correcting them and straightening out their doctrine and i started finding myself bitter I, I found myself getting really edgy and almost mechanical and i said god something's wrong he said yeah he said you're focusing more on what they don't believe than on what I believe about you. He said, you're more focused on their error than you are on my love for you. And he said, you, you've got to drop it. He said, there, there are going to be universalists around till I come back. He said, don't, he said, just don't let your people get into that. But he said, don't make a big, don't focus on that. Drop it. Drop it. He said, there's universalists. The devil has always been a universalist. He doesn't want anybody believing anything. He said, that, don't, don't treat that like it's a big deal. He said, even folks in the grace camp, he said, they be, are becoming universalists, believing that you don't have to believe anything, don't have to do anything, that everybody's saved, the whole world's saved, and that faith is a dead work. He said, stop arguing. He said, you've become argu your flesh. You're letting your flesh rile up. He said, uh, just get back to focusing on my love for you and feed your people on my love for you. He said, when you hold the real thing, the counterfeit is obvious. My daughter and son both worked as bank tellers. They never tried to show them what counterfeit was. They, they didn't show them all the counterfeit. They said, as you handle the real money day by day, as you keep handling the real paper money, the real stuff, when a counterfeit gets into your hands, you'll go, oh, that doesn't feel the same. Huh, that must be universalism. That must be error. And the Lord said, if you'll keep preaching the truth, you will build the ability for your people to understand the counterfeit. Duh, we're not getting into it ever. You have to believe God. But knowing the truth is the antidote. It's not always talking about 
Universalism. It, it's, it's, we don't need to be caught up in that. Amen. We correct it when we need to, but we don't get caught up in it. The real deal. Praise God. Hallelujah. God doesn't want some, God loves us so much that He won't force you to have a relationship with Him. Universalism forces everyone into South, their false teaching believes that everybody's saved, whether they believe it or not, whether they want it or not, whether they choose it or not. And I, my answer to that is God loves people so much and respects their freedom of choice so much, He won't force you to live with Him without your consent. He won't force you to live with Him for eternity without your consent. Faith, receiving Jesus, is your consent. Now, if God was a universalist, and just everybody's saved, everybody's in, whether you want to be or not, the work of Jesus covers all of that. It's the work of Jesus. that You can't limit the work of Jesus by your faith. All that garbage. Okay? That's God basically forcing you into a relationship, which means God acts just like Satan, because Satan loves to force people into things. God doesn't force. God's not, God's not the devil. God respects you enough to let you go to hell if that's your choice. Man, that's powerful. Now, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which, by His grace, He made us accepted. He made us accepted. He made us accepted in the Beloved. Woo! If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're in Christ. You're in the Beloved. And, it's, and guess what? then if you're in the Beloved, then you're hearing God say the same thing to you that He said to the Beloved back there in that baptism. You are my Beloved Son, and in you I'm well pleased. Oh, glory! Now, this word accepted, this Greek word accepted, is only used twice in the New Testament. Here... And over when the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary and said, Hail Mary, highly favored among women with whom God is pleased. Highly favored among women. And that is the Greek word keratao. Keratao is the word grace, but it's grace on steroids. It's not just favored, it's highly favored. Favored. This is such a rare term. It's only God only used it twice. Once with the Virgin Mary, just before she carried Christ in her womb. He said, Mary, you are so highly favored that I find you worthy to carry the holy, spotless Son of God inside of you. I see you as a fit place for the Son of God to live for nine months. You're highly favored. That word is used again in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He has made us highly favored in the Beloved. You, listen, brothers and sisters, Jumpstart Nation, you are so, God has made you so highly favored that, and so holy in your spirit that you can carry His Son, the Spirit of His Son inside of you and it doesn't diminish who He is. You are so highly favored and so accepted like Mary that you are as pure as Virgin Mary in your spirit. You are so highly favored that you can carry Christ in you, the Son of God. He's comfortable in you. You're favored. You are highly favored financially, physically. You are highly favored whether gas is $8 a gallon or $0.50 cents a gallon. You're highly favored. So favored that God says... Just as pure as Virgin Mary was, you are virgin in your spirit, pure and clean in your born-again spirit, able to carry the Son of God. Say this out loud. And notice, God made you that way. You didn't make you that way. God did it. Glory, I'm preaching to me. Oh, man. Oh, man. Glory to God. Say this out loud. According to Ephesians 1.6. According to the Word of God, God has made me highly favored in the Beloved. I am in the Beloved One. 
And I am as pure and clean and favored as Mary, the mother of Jesus. Oh, man, the favor of God's all over you. Favor coming, favor going. Your kids are coming to the Lord. The word that you've sown is coming to pass. You have such high favor on you that when you walk into a business, you leave the essence of God's favor in the very atmosphere and those businesses change just because you walked in. When you walk into your church, you release the fragrance of favor. When you walk into your business, you release the fragrance of, of favor. Angels are in awe of who you have been made by God. Angels are in awe of who you are. Angels will bow at the Christ that's in you, the God that's in you. You are highly favored. All is well. Say it out loud. I am accepted and highly favored in the beloved. I am codependent no more. I don't have to fix anybody. I don't have to overhelp people. I will point them to the Savior. Man, that's awesome. Have an awesome week. Love you guys. We're one week closer to the conference. Make sure you come. If you don't register online, come anyway. You can register. It's free unless you want the meal plan. Uh, but come. Come anyway. If you want to come last minute, come on to Maysville, Kentucky. Uh, and let's have a ball Thursday, Friday uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Let's have a blast in Jesus. I love you with all of my heart. Have an awesome weekend. See you Monday morning.